what's up everybody and welcome to another episode of blood on the razor wire tv where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw don't forget hit that subscribe button hit the like button share the video got a good video today man a guy that you know i was closely connected with helped him with his legal work he ended up getting out of prison spent a bunch of time in prison sentenced to a a sentence that would just destroy most people but this dude didn't give up he kept fighting and he's here now Delion banks man tell the people who you are Tell them where you're from and talk a little bit about how you ended up in federal prison and what your sentence was. Yeah, my name is uh, Dalian Banks. Uh, I'm from uh, I'm from Oklahoma, from a little small town. You know what I mean? Ended up moving uh, to Tulsa, Oklahoma after I got older. You know what I mean? Was just got into you know different stuff. You know what I mean? Got involved with different things. You know what I mean? And ended up behind behind bars you know what i mean and did a little time you know what i mean actually a lot of time on some on some on some charges that you know what i mean that i wasn't even familiar with but most people ain't familiar with you know got caught up and did Let a lot of time you. got 44 year sentence then you know i took it to trial you know what i mean i you know Dalian, let me ask you this. How old were you when you were arrested? Um, I think I was 30. I was 29 or 30. Yeah. 29, 30 years old. You get sentenced to 44 years in federal prison under stack 924 C's. What did it feel like when they imposed that sentence, bro? You know what, man? I thought it was, I thought it was unreal because, you know, uh, cause you know, when I was, when I was coming up, you know, uh, when I was out there in the world just doing my thing, you know what I mean? I had friends. They were going in and out of prison, you know what I mean? But this was on a state level, you know? They was going in and out of prison. So when I started messing around in the game a little bit after I fell on hard times, I was like, you know, I I can do that. I can go in, you know what I mean? I can go in and get out. You know, that was my impression of of the legal system, you know what I mean? Because I wasn't really familiar with all the laws. So when I started doing my thing, man, and I got popped and they, and my lawyer approached me with this time. And I was like, this don't, this, this don't seem right. You know what I mean? I'm like, how as a person, first time, first time being offered jail time, you know what I mean? Cause I'd never been to prison. Never been and to it, prison. It was, a, it was, it was a shock, bro never been to prison and you end up sentenced to 44 years you you know when you were out here doing your thing right you use the word thing what were you doing were you selling crack were you robbing people what were you telling people what you were doing no man I, I how it started out man I was uh I was working as a maintenance man at an apartment complex and I had lost my job there because they came under new management and, you know usually they get rid of the people that that's working for them when new management come up so I lost my job and I was kind of looking for another job and in between that I was running out of money, you know? So I called a friend back home and he was like, you know what I mean? I was like, man, I need to, I need to get my rent. I got to get my rent paid. So I linked up with him and we started doing this and that and that. And it was really, it was, it was meth, methamphetamines. You know what I mean? I was selling methamphetamines. So that's how it started. You know what I mean? I started doing it and five months later, I was behind bars. You had a five-month run selling methamphetamine, nonviolent drug offender, and the federal government says, you know what? For your charges, for the last five months, we're going to give you 40-something years in prison. Shocking, right? Yeah, but I but I had I had I had I had pistols with me too, you know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean it's still a nonviolent crime. We're going to talk about the stack. Oh, nine. yeah, yeah, yeah. You got stack nine twenty-four C's, right? First gun's five, yep. second gun gun's twenty-five. A lot of yep. people didn't realize that that's how that thing worked. But you you got all this time, and now you're on a video with me. Tell the people how that's even possible, and then we'll get into prison a little bit. Well, just I don't know how that's possible, bro. It's it's it's. After, after I look back on everything, man, and I and I look up to this point. All I can say is, uh, there had to be there's a higher 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 power, man, out there that that was just guiding this this at work out there. You know what I mean? That just guided us to this point right here, and you know what I mean. 
and I thank I'm thankful for it. You know what I mean? I just, you know, you put in the work, you try to do the right thing, and then here we are. And you end up getting in contact with me, right? Tell the people how we end up getting in contact. Well, I remember one day when they passed the first step that when Trump was in office and uh, they had changed the compassionate release stuff to where um, if the uh, if the warden didn't respond to your motion in 30 days, you could go ahead and shoot your motion to the judge. And, and they had changed, the, um, I think, the rules on the 924Cs. What they do is this, right? Donald Trump's the president. You know, under 924C, your first gun charge is five. Your second one's 25. They can all be in the same indictment. And that's how you end up getting banged. So they come back and say, you know what? We're going to eliminate this 25 years, and we're going to make it so it's only five. Yes. They do that. But it's not an automatic get-out-of-jail-free card. If it's no. in the discretion of the judge. First, you've got to petition the warden. After you petition the warden, if he doesn't respond in 30 days, you can file a motion. You end up reaching out to me. I work on your case, right? Take well, the people here, from there. Here's how, it, here's how it first started. After I figured out that they had changed the uh, compassion release stuff and they had changed the law to 924C stacking down to from 25 to 5 on the second one, it was a friend of mine. He, he approached me in there and he was like, look, Banks. He says, man, if anybody can benefit from this, I think you can. His name was Chris Gibson. And he said, uh, he says, man, we're, we need to write up a motion to the warden under compassionate release. And uh, I don't think he's going to answer it. So we went to the law library. We did it all up. You know what I mean? And uh, we shot it to the warden. The warden didn't answer. But we already had the motion to the judge ready. It was, you know, it was just a basic motion. But we had we had some decent points in there, and we shot it to the judge. You know, but it took. But I used the motion. I used the argument that you had used. Your argument when you argued when you was in New York was one of my strongest arguments. I was like, okay, this is. This is some good. This is some good stuff. You know what I mean? Maybe the prosecutor will, you know, go along with this. And so we did it. We were sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. I never got a response. And finally, the government responds, and they deny it. You know what I mean? But the judge never made a ruling on it. And that's when I. That's when I contacted you. I'd waited for like a year, maybe over a year for the judge to respond. Then I contacted you and I asked you if you could, uh, you know, actually, actually I called, I called this, uh, who did I call? I called this number. They was like, you need to contact this, this number right here. And then and it just happened to be you on the other end of the phone. He was like, he was like, I was like, this is Chad. I was like, Chad Marks. You know, and it, and it kind of, I was like, I was threw off, man. I was like, all right, man. I was like, man, I just used you in one of my arguments. On, I used your, I used your case, man. And we, you know how we just started talking from there, you know, and then I asked you if there was anything you could do to help me. And you was like, hell yeah, man. We, and I'll, look, I'll take a look at it. And we went from there. You, you, you kind of cleaned up a little bit of stuff, added some stuff and we shot it back in there, man. And eventually the judge ends up granting your motion. You get out of prison. Now you're out here living your best life, right? Yup. Thanks to, thanks to uh, all the people that was around me, Chris, you, my brother. I couldn't have done it without y'all, man. Couldn't have done it without y'all. And I remember when you contacted me, we talked a couple times and then you're like, man, you're a white dude. You didn't, you didn't even know I was white because the stuff that I wrote, <laughs> you thought I was black, right? Yeah, I did. I was like, damn, this this guy out here doing a damn thing, a white boy. <laughs> oh, it's all good, man. So it just it just threw me off, man. I was just I just expected you to be a, a black dude, you know what I mean? It's all I good, man. I don't know why. Because all the articles just... I wrote in the criminal legal news, prisoners legal news, I wrote a lot of stuff. I had a crack case. Um 
know, sometimes we stereotype things, but it's all right. It doesn't matter. What matters is, is that you ended up getting out of prison. That's what matters. I want to talk a little bit about prison though, man. You're a young man and you, you're walking into prison with 44 years. What's the first prison that you go to? Oh, uh, I, was, I was down there in Beaumont, behind the walls, bloody Beaumont. You know what I mean? They used to call it bloody Beaumont. When I got off the bus, I walked up in there, you know what I mean? You know how you get to the gate. They're flashing their mirrors under the bus, and they got you all chained up in the little black boxes and stuff, and they take you in, they process you. And then you got to walk down this long run outside, and you see all the buildings. And I look up, and I'm like, man, this is crazy. This is crazy. And then you hear people beating on the windows and stuff. You know what I mean? Then you go into your unit. And the first thing that happens to me, you know, I'm not familiar with prison. The first thing that happens to me, they assign me to this cell with a Muslim brother, right? He, he approaches me. He says, uh, are you Muslim? I said, no, I'm not Muslim, bro. I'm native. And he says, uh, he says, uh, well, you can't stay in here. I'm like, damn, you know, so I'm, this is my first impression of prison. So like, you can't stand here. So we're going to have to find you somewhere else to stay. I was like, damn. So y'all just overruled the administration. They, I mean, they, they, they assigned me to this cell. They was like, well, no, no, we ain't having that. You know what I mean? It just, you, you know how it is in there. I know how so, it is, but the people don't. I want you to tell the people. <laughs> so, uh. I go in there and then I end up going to another cell, you know what I mean? So I'm in a, you know, totally different cell than I expected to be in. Then it was just that night reality set in real tough. Like, damn, man, I got to do 40, four years, 38, 37 ish of this 44 in a place like this. And it was, it was just surreal, man. Just having to get up at a certain time having to listen and just people tell you what to do all day long. It's it, 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 it torture, man. Who takes you into the cell? Are, do the natives come up to you and tell you, hey, man, or do they like, hey, he, this dude's a native, man. He's got to get out of my well, cell. Here's how it kind of went. I was native when I, you know what I mean? I didn't just come out and tell them I was native at first, you know what I mean? Because I'd always hung around black people, you know what I mean? Which I'm part of black too, you know? So, when I first went to prison, I hung, I was, I was, I was, I sat at the Oklahoma car. You know what I mean? They had a like, you know how it's segregated in there. Oklahoma blacks sit with each other. Oklahoma whites sit with each other. This gang of Oklahoma sit with each other. I was sitting with the Oklahoma blacks at first. So I had a, I had a black celly at first. So the whole time I was at Beaumont, I, I, I was hanging with the blacks at the time. You know what I mean? Then when I, I transferred, to Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, the bros up there figured out that I was that I had a uh, you know that I was native, and they was like, "Man, you can't you you need to sit with us, you know what I mean? You need to you need to chill with us, bro." And I was like, "Man, I don't know, man, you know, because you know I, I was always used to just being where I was, and they was like, "No, nah, you need to come on." So I just like, "All right, cool, I'll I'll, I'll chill with y'all, you know what I mean?" And then from then on, I just I start rolling with the natives, you know what I mean? Let me ask you this, Dahlia. When you're in Beaumont, right? And you yeah. said, you know, people are telling you what to do. You're not just talking about the cops. You're talking about the prisoners too, the shot callers. That type of shit happens there, right? Where you got a shot oh, caller. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, you got, you got, you got every, every ethnicity, every state got someone that they go to, to, uh, to deal with problems, either with the inmates, the administration, the COs, they got one or two people that will go up there and deal with the issues at hand, whether it be with, a, if it's administration, you know, they take a couple people up there from that car that usually speaks for that, for that, for that group of people, you know what I mean? And in, in the same way, when it comes to the inmates, you know what I mean? You get People that's either been there the longest, that know the most, you know what I mean? The more ropes that's going on and whatnot, you know what I mean? They, they just, you got to have that because it's got to have some kind of structure, you know what I mean? It's got to be that way. When you're, in, when you're in Beaumont, it was known as being one of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous prison at the time that you were there. Did you experience things and see things there? Oh, yeah, man. Like, I remember one time 
we were we were you know how they got basketball leagues. It was a um, we were playing in a basketball league and we had a coach. He uh he had made a bet on the game, and we had won the we had won the game, so he won the bet, right? And then the next time we had a game, the other guy that he betted against assumed that they had a bet back. But then we we lost that game, right? And then the dude was expecting his pay, but the dude was like, "No, nah, we never had no bet back, right?" So a couple of days later, we're we're up for breakfast early, and the dude, the our coach, right? He was standing down on the on the bottom run, and all of a sudden, the guy that he had a bet with just came off the top top railway and just stabbed him right in the neck with with a pick, you know what I mean? <clears throat> they rushed him to the hospital. You know what I mean? A couple months later, a uh, officer got killed down there in the shoe where they took the officer's keys. They stabbed, they didn't kill officer, but they stabbed the officer up because there was an inmate in the back back there talking smack. And they was, you know, they was like, we're going to get to you somehow. Somehow they got the cop's keys. They stabbed the cop up. They went in a dude's cell, killed him. You know what I mean? There was a riot down there. There was a riot down there between the the Texas guys and the D.C. guys where they had to move all the all the D.C. guys out. You know, what I mean, then they switched it after that happened. They switched it to a high medium. They shipped everybody that was there. That was they only left like a couple hundred people on the yard and they shipped them all over from Coleman to Canaan to Big Sandy. They shipped them everywhere. Let's talk about, I know the, the incident you were talking about was with the dude Snar and the, the Spanish dude. They go in the cell and stab to kill the D.C. dude or whatever. Let's talk about the Texas and D.C. thing. Was that between the black Texas dudes and the D.C. dudes? Yeah, it was between the black Texas dudes and uh, the D.C. dudes, the black D.C. dudes. Yeah, man, it was, and it started over a cell. I think it started over a cell. And uh, somehow it just, you know how something small could just all of a sudden blow up and it just got, it just got out of hand, man. It just, we were headed to work one morning. It had been brewing for a day that morning. They decided that, you know, it, a couple of Texas dudes jumped on a DC dude that morning. As soon as they popped the doors and then the DC dudes was just, had decided to jump on some Texas dudes down in another unit. It was all over, bro. It was, it was something going on in every unit. And then they locked it down. And then they had caught the, you know, you get ready to go to Unicorn in the morning and everybody's moving out on the yard and they're everywhere. Everybody's going this way and that way. And this is before they had control movement. And they started locking the gates and everybody was stuck in certain areas. Then you had a, like a few Texas dudes stuck in a spot where you got 20 or 30 DC dudes and it was chaos, bro. They were shooting grenades, pepper spray, bullets. You know what I mean? And you witnessed some of this stuff? I mean, what did it happen? Oh, yeah, I, wit- I witnessed all of it. I was right out there. You know what I mean? You know, we, we, you know when you're in your own little group, you, you get together and you got to push yourself to the side. You know what I mean? But, yeah, it was, it was, it, I, there was a couple of riots there, man. There was, and after they moved uh, the D.C. guys and the Texas guys out of there, the ones that was super high security, they had brought a bunch of Pisces down there. And they got into it with the Tongo Blast. You know what I mean? And it was another little riot that happened between DC, them. Was the D.C. riot worse? I want to talk about that. Oh, yeah. Riot. The D.C. riot was way worse. It was way worse. Everybody a few stabbed people got each stabbed. other. A lot, of, a lot of people got stabbed. Like a buddy of mine, they shipped him to uh, out west. I went to uh, Pennsylvania. and. Uh, when we linked back up, I remember seeing him getting stabbed on the yard. We we met back up at El Reno. I was like, dang, man, you, we went totally different directions, but we ended up back in, a, in El Reno over there at the medium. And I was asking him about it. I was like, man, I seen you get stabbed that day, man. And he was showing me his scars in his side and stuff. I was like, dang, bro, I thought you was out of there. You know what I mean? I thought he was out of there. He made it, though. They rushed him to the hospital, I guess, and stitched him up. But I seen him, he, him and his brother was both caught and it was just chaos. It was like 
just a group of people you really couldn't hardly tell who was who and they was just going at it you know what i mean and, and you had the officers on the other side of the gate which they wasn't in there with them but they were spraying pepper spray and shooting rubber bullets at them and you know shooting con con uh, concussion grenades at them you know what i mean and i'm just standing right there looking at the whole thing i'm like damn this is crazy you're watching this riot and you're like damn but how do you feel inside are you nervous a little bit like oh shit man are you scared a little bit Ain't nothing wrong with being nervous, bro. You're scared. No, I was just more like, uh, I was just like, man, I, I was more or less like, damn, man, this is, how did I get myself in a situation like this? I really wouldn't, would you call scared? I was just more, I, me, I was always thinking like, this is my life now. You know what I mean? Uh, this is what happens, you know? And I try, I just try my best to stay out the way. But it, it, it is kind of intimidating, you know what I mean? It does get intimidating when, you, when you're around that in, type of environment. And back then, it was live, you know what I mean? Super live, you know what I mean? It, was, it wasn't like it was when I dropped down a level in security. I mean, you could go, you could get up in the morning, and there's guys standing outside the unit selling shoes, light covers vegetables onions tomatoes bell peppers just got a whole swap meet sitting out in front of the unit the officers don't say don't say nothing they'll be like put it up you know what i mean but back then it was it was wide open guys were buying and selling drink you know they was just it was just it was just moving and it, it was just you know me but of course me i never really got involved in it because my whole mindset when i went to prison was that my whole thought was that I was going to get out one day. The, the very first day I set foot in there. You don't believe it, no one else will. I used to tell people that all the time. People would be like, Chad, you think I'm going to win my case? You think I'm going to get out of jail? I tell them, man, if you don't believe it, no one else will. And, you know, and you Cedric know, Dean told me that. And, you know, they were talking about those stack 924Cs back then. And this was early, mid 2000s ask you this you know is it we're gonna to get to the Pisces and the tango blast in a minute too but is it fair to say that the cops were scared that worked there oh yeah oh yeah man you had a few of them that uh you know i mean you had a few of them that was gung-ho but by and large the cops were really just yeah they're all scared man they're all scared they, deep down they're all scared you can tell because you know as soon as something pop off the first thing they do you know they, they put their hand on their hip like, you know what I mean? They're going to push the button, even if, even with the, the slightest little thing, you know what I mean? So, and you know, it ain't that many of them. We outnumber them. So, of course, they're going to be scared. So, when the riot's going on, the cops don't run in there and save people. They're shooting tear gas through the fence. They don't want to come in there, right? Right. They're not going in there. Not No, they wasn't going in there that morning. No. No. How long are the people fighting before the cops actually do get in there after they tear gas people? Are they fighting for t five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes? Oh, man, they fought on? for that morning. They fought for a good 15 minutes, bro. And you know, 15 minutes is a stretch. 10, good 10, good 10 or 15 minutes. They were going. They were going. They finally got them. They finally got them to where, you know, you know, they had to bring some, some security from, we was at a complex. They had to bring some security from the medium, the camp, the low. You know, I mean, they brought, you know, they finally got enough numbers up to, to actually slow it down. You know what I mean? Then, you know, of course, they separated us, made everybody go to uh, back to the unit. And, you know, of course, we got locked down for a couple of weeks. Actually, we got locked down for a whole month and a half after that because they didn't let nobody back up. So they started shipping people. They start shipping people. They end up letting you guys up. And now there's another riot, Pisces versus the Tango Blast. Tell me yeah. about it. Well, after after they shipped everybody, it got down. The numbers got down to like 200, maybe 250 people from like 1,200. And uh, I ended up being one of the lucky ones that got to stay there. Oh, I guess you'd say lucky. Yeah, you call that lucky, staying at Beaumont? Yeah, but they were, at the time, nobody was trying to leave. You know what I mean? You know how you get to a spot, you get comfortable. Nobody wants to go anywhere. You know what I mean? 
And they're all talking like, oh, I don't think I'm going anywhere. And next thing you know, they're gone. And I didn't know if I was going to make the cut or not because I was working in Unicor. You know, in Unicor, you're making decent money if you're getting a, a grade one or a premium grade. And at the time, I was getting a premium grade, one of the highest pays there. So I really wasn't trying to go anywhere at the time. And I knew I wasn't able to go to a to a medium yet because I still had over 30 years. And I didn't qualify to go to a medium until, until I got under 30 by their policies or whatever they whatnot they got going on. But uh, after they uh, shipped everybody out, they brought a bunch of people from uh, Colorado's medium. It was a bunch of natives. And then they brought a bunch of Pisces in. And, a, you know, I mean, just lower security people. They kind of, they, they actually changed it into a medium for like two or three years. From, um, from 08, when that happened, to 2011, it was a medium, considered a medium. Then once they got in, <clears throat> once you get a lot of, of Pisces together, they tend to, uh, you know what I mean? They, they tend to try to take over stuff. They'll take over the kitchen. And they'll try to bully the other Mexicans over the TVs and stuff like that. And that stuff started happening. And uh, one thing, one, one day they were sitting there watching TV. You had, a, you had two TVs for the Hispanics, right? One stayed on Spanish. And the other one was for just the other Mexicans that, you know what I mean, that wouldn't, that could, you know what I mean, speak English and all that. One day... <clears throat> The Pisces decided they was just going to take both TVs. Yeah, like they do no, that. They try to do that stuff sometimes. Yeah, right? they just decided they was just going to take both TVs, and then the other Mexicans kind of like rose up, especially the Tongo Blast. I think they're the ones with the Houston symbol from Houston. Sure, I think you're. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, you're they, right. they got the Houston symbol, and I think they're mostly from down that area. But anyway, they was out on the, out on a basketball court one day. And we was out there playing basketball again. And then all of a sudden, about 100 Pisces and uh, Tango Blast get into it. Of course, the Tango Blasts were outnumbered, but, you know, they were putting up a good little – they were holding their own, you know what I mean? But they were, they were getting it. It wasn't really no knife play in this one, but it was, it was a lot of people. A lot of people. A lot of people. You say no knife play, but are they out there throwing rocks at each other, stuff Man, like they that? Were throwing, like... They were throwing the the, uh, the benches, the water coolers. They was, it, it just looked like like you were at a concert and, sh and shit was flying everywhere. You know what I mean? It was, I was like, damn. It was crazy, bro. But it, it wasn't listen, nothing bro, like listen, it wasn't nothing like the uh, it wasn't nothing like the Texas uh, DC. It was it was just more like a hand fight, you know what I mean, type of thing. But it was it was it was it was it was, it was a lot of them. It was a lot of them. And they, in that time, they had to they had to bring other security from the other spots too to over there to stop it. I've seen the Pisces in Lee County, man, get into it, right? And that's why I said, were they throwing rocks? Like these dudes were throwing rocks and bocce yeah. balls, whatever, whatever they could pick up. Whatever they could get their hands on they were throwing it bro that's why i said you it just looked like graffiti going through the air i was like damn so let me ask you this right because i've said this before and, and you know i don't want to promote violence and stuff like that and you know sometimes when there is violence it does affect you mentally and emotionally but sometimes when this shit's going on it's like when you go to a ufc fight or are you sometimes excited you're like oh shit like your adrenaline's pumping you're watching these dudes you're like you're into it a little bit right Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely are. I mean, you you can tell when something's about to go down because normally the yard is like you can hear people talking this, doing this, you just hear the hustle and bustle of the, of the of the of the yard. When something's about to go down, it gets extremely quiet, and then you know when it gets quiet, you're like. You're like, oh shit, what's going on? So you start looking around, and that's when you start like that feeling, like um, an emotional feeling comes up, that excitement feeling. You're like, oh shit, go find your people. Something's about to go down. 
So everybody will start clicking up, like, and then, you know, all of a sudden, something will jump off. Because, you know, once it gets quiet, bro, something's about to go down. I want the people that are watching to understand that when you say you find your people. Like, when it's quiet and something's going on, the whole yard gets quiet and, you know, you, you yeah. got a group over here, you got a group over there, the natives are over here, the white dudes are over here, the crips are over there, the pikes yeah. are over here. And then all of a sudden, it's like, the people that got problems, it seems like this happens all the time. They all just clash right there in the middle of the yard, right? They start right in the middle, bro. Home. Yes, you got you got to get to your people because if not, you get caught up in something or get caught in the wrong area at the right time, and you could get hurt, and it could cause more problems. You know what I mean? Because it could, it could get bigger than it is. You know. What's one of the worst things you ever seen in prison, Dalia? Well, that just that, that probably that riot that that time, you know, that riot, the D.C. and Texas guys. I've seen a couple people get stabbed. I've seen a bunch of people get stomped out just to the point to where you thought they were dead. But. Yeah, not even those stabbings, not even those two stabbings. It was I was in uh, El Reno medium. And one morning we get up and these three guys jump on this, jump on this guy. And they just beat him and beat him and beat him and beat him and beat him. And beat him. Bro, guys. boot after boot on the face. You know, he's just unconscious, but they're still just smashing on him, bro. And I was like, blood's everywhere. You know, it's it, it it was it was it was it was gruesome, man. White I dudes. Never really, uh, was it I white never dudes? Really thought, black dudes, Spanish. It dudes, was some like white dudes. It was some white dudes, and I never thought I would see that in a lower security, because I was kind of naive. You know what I mean? Because when I left the USP, we went from uh, bean holes in our door, you know what I mean, to coming to a medium to where there's no bean holes. So when when they feed us, they were like, when I got there, they was like, yeah, we're hardly ever locked down. I'm like, damn, okay. So, and you know, the movement was a lot less strict. You know what I mean? A lot, a lot less controlled. It was a little more freedom per se in a medium as far as like movement, but the cops were still dickheads. You know what I mean? The cops are always dickheads. Let me ask you. <laughs> Let me, I don't know if you know, but it's been largely reported that um, that two MS, a couple MS-13 dudes killed two Serenos at Beaumont last two weeks yeah. ago. I didn't know if I'm you knew. I'm familiar with it. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. Uh, I was, um, what was I doing? I was on my phone looking through something and I seen it. I was like, well, that doesn't surprise me. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that sounds about right for Beaumont. You know what I mean? A couple when, people getting killed. When you see that on, I, when you see that on I your phone, do you kind of yeah. say, "Man, I'm glad I'm not there no more." Man, I did. I'm like, "Wow, wow!" And then they had a nationwide lockdown for everybody in all the prisons, and plus there was a little bit of COVID breaking back out. But uh, a couple of my friends was like, "I ain't called you, man, because uh, we've been on lockdown." A nationwide lockdown, I was like, yeah, I know because of this. And I filled them in because a lot of times people in other spots don't know what's going on. They'll just lock you down for this and this, and they'll find out later what happened. But I was fortunate enough to be able to tell a couple of my buddies in there what was going on, you know what I mean, while they were locked down and all that, you know. Let's talk a little bit about your motion and, and when you get out of prison, right? So, you know, I end up writing that. You you guys file something. I go in there. I supplement it. I think we wrote a 30 or 40-page motion, somewhere in that range. We do the reply. Your brother's calling me. He's like, hey, man, what's up with my brother, bro? Right? And I'm like, look, dude, I'm going to do the reply. We write the reply. And eventually, the judge grants your motion. Tell the people what it feels like, man. When you, How do you find out that you won? I was sitting in my cell during count one day. And I'm sitting there with my celly. We're just sitting there chopping it up like we usually do. And my caseworker walks to the door and um, he's, he says, Banks. And I was like, yeah. And he says, I need you to step outside the cell and uh, I, need, I got something to tell you. I'm like, all right. You know what I mean? I wasn't even thinking about 
the motion at the time. You know what I mean? Because it had been two years. He'd been sitting you were on, on me, though. Years. You were on me like, hey, you left me alone for a while. And I'm like, look, man, just be patient. And then you'd hit me up in a couple months. And I'd be like, dude, I'm trying. Then you're like, bro, we got to do this reply. And I'm like, I got you. We do it. And we're waiting. And we're waiting. And I'm like, damn, this something. I thought there'd be a sooner, a decision sooner. So yeah. go ahead. Uh, then I was sitting there. And he, he said that to me. He walked out. And he was like, uh, you got to pack your stuff. You got an immediate release. And I was like. And I was like, I looked at him. I was like, serious? And he was like, yeah, man, you got to get your stuff and pack up now because you're about to go home. And my, remind me, my door is wide open, right? And I looked back at my celly. My celly was wide-eyed. He was, and all, hey, he started crying before I did, bro. He was already teared up before I, because me and him was tight. You know, one of my native bros, he, 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 he ran out to the run, man, gave me a hug and everything. I was like, man, we and he put, he put me back in the cell. He locked the door, and we were sitting there chopping it up. I was I was I was in shock. My um, my anxiety went off out of the roof. So I was in a I felt like I was in a state of disbelief at the time. So and I felt that way all the way into like two months that I was out. I didn't feel normal. You know what I mean? I felt my anxiety was so bad. But it was it was it was a good feeling, man. And everybody on my unit, you know what I mean, they respected me. You know what I mean? I was I was one of the elders in my group, you know what I mean? And everybody respected me, you know what I mean? So they 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 everybody was waiting for me to go home. You know what I mean? They were they they uh, they were all happy, you know what I mean? They throw me a, you know what I mean? It was it was a good time. Everybody gave me a hug. I think everybody in that unit, Mexicans, blacks whites everybody gave me a hug bro and then you just don't see that too often you know what i mean i was just looking at my phone to look at your brother's messages but i think i i erased them man i cleaned out my phone i got a new phone um and i remember writing him like hey man your brother won you know and i wrote that to him and he yeah. was like man he was like thank you man so much i appreciate you but really man it's not me bro it's by the grace of god that you got out of prison yeah. man he just used yeah. me as a tool bro yeah, I, I I didn't say God earlier because you know a lot of people, you know what I mean. A lot of people don't like to hear hear you that. Did but, you know I mean? you I, did I, mention I, God, man. I definitely believe in God. You know what I mean. But uh, uh here's what uh, there was another guy in there that had just won a case out of Kansas for some stack nine twenty four C's, but he had some nine twenty four C's down there in uh in Oklahoma too. I think he had like seventy or eighty years, and he got like forty of it knocked off from the Kansas case, and it was this uh public defender i don't know if she's a public defender but she was working on his case and he gave me her number so i had my brother call her and she she was like looking at the motion she looked at them she looked our case up and she was looking at the motion that you and uh chris had put together and she was like oh my god some people in prison did this and she was like, and now, and, my, and she, my brother was telling her, like, yeah, some people in prison did this. So she actually went and talked to my judge, and I, that, I think that's how I got sped up, because when she went and talked to my judge, my brother called her again, and my, she had told my brother that the reason why he hasn't got to my case was because of the COVID backlog. You know what I mean? And he had retired, but he was still working on cases. And not a week after that, he ruled on my motion. And I used your decision in another case um, with a guy that was at El Reno. I don't. Uh, did you know Daniel Gregory, the white dude? Daniel Gregory. Was he from El Reno? He was from Oklahoma too. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't think I know him. He had thirty-two years. I wrote no. his. I wrote his stuff, and I used your case in his motion, and then. Um, I think Fam ended up getting him a lawyer, and then the lawyer filed it. But I wrote it, and he got out too, man. But I used your case because of your circuit. Like I said, look what they did over here in Oklahoma. You know, the same core. So you should do the same yeah. thing that you did for Dalyan and, and do it for this guy. And, and he ended up getting out. So again, man, by the grace of God, I'm glad that you guys are out. You also yeah, had a. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The motion I used your your argument. Hey, man, your your argument was like that. 
you're and, 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 and then, but the way you got out, you got out in a totally different way than we did. I don't know what you filed under or how you did it. I don't know how you did it. I filed that Holloway motion first, and the then Holloway, my judge yeah. used the words extraordinary. So this is an extraordinary case that deserves an extraordinary remedy. And he asked the government to open the case. They refused. They were like, I'm really, they were like vicious. They said I was a piece of shit. I shouldn't get out. And then I went back and we filed the 3582. Um, former federal judge John Gleason got on the case. I got out the same way you got out. I got oh, out okay. before you. But, you know, and I started working on your case right after I got out. I, I would think I was out, what, two, three months and we got yeah, the business. Yep. yep. You so also, Holloway, Holloway, he got out a different way. Yeah, oh, okay. you, you confuse me. Yeah, you can you confuse me with Holloway, but this is the other thing. You had a friend down there, an old man named Oliver Higgins. Do you remember Oliver? Yes, I was thinking about him this morning. Yes, I did Oliver's case right around the same time as yours, and it's still pending. The judge has not done anything. I've reached out to Brittany Barnett, who worked with Kim Kardashian. I've reached out to everybody. I've posted him on Facebook. It's not my fault, man. It's it's the judge. Oh, I- the judge just will not answer us. We know, we know, we know it ain't your fault, man. You, you're a good guy, man. You, if you, if you're on his case, he's got a good person behind him. You know what I mean? You're going to do it the right way. And I tell everybody in there, I recommended you to a lot of people, you know what I mean? And a lot of times, you know, they'll, they'll be like, yeah, I can't trust this person. I can trust this person. But when they actually see somebody get out and they're like, oh yeah, you know what I mean? I use this guy. This guy helped me get out. I had 44 years. My life was over. And I'm on the streets now. I'm just happy for you. So tell the people, man, before we get ready to go, tell the people what you're doing in your life, man. Because I see you on Facebook. I see you shining. You're working. Got a beautiful girl. I hear a baby in the background. I don't know uh, if you had any kids yet or anything. But tell the people what you're doing with your life, man. Because that's what's important. When I first got out, I had a little struggle uh, trying to get my identification because my license was suspended, didn't know that, had to get a birth certificate, and everything's different out here now. You got to file everything online, and it takes months to get everything done. I thought I was going to get out and just be able to get my birth certificate, get my license, uh, go to CDL school, and be done in a couple of months. But that wasn't the case. I'm just now about to start school on the 28th, but everything's been going good. You know what I mean? Everything that I planned on doing, it's just taking a little longer, but it's all coming. It's all coming together. You know what I mean? I kick it with my grandbabies. My, I got a beautiful, beautiful girl. We got the grandbaby over here right now. I got a, I got a good job right now, driving a truck for a company. Everything's going good, man. Everything's going good. Sure is better I, than. Uh, it sure is better than working in the kitchen or Unicor, right? Oh yes. Oh yeah. I. I like when I first got out, I told I told my girl, right? I was like, man, I, I I don't mind paying bills. That's bills and this worldly stuff right here. I I'd much rather deal with this than deal with them COs, deal with those inmates in jail that ain't got a vision. You know what I mean? And this, I'd rather much rather do this. And, you know, you, you see people out here stressing about little things, this, this, and that, and that. And I'm like, man, this is nothing to me. This is easy. You know, there's guys that watch the show that been to prison, state prison, federal prison. There's women that been there. They write me and say, Chad, man, I'm struggling. You know, sometimes I feel like doing this, but your show keeps me on track. You got a hell of a story, man, because you lost your job. You couldn't pay your rent. You got involved in the drug game for five months. And in five months, you ended up with a 44-year sentence for five months of selling meth. There's somebody out there today watching this video that's thinking about going down the wrong road because they can't pay their bills today because they lost their job. What would you tell them, man? That whenever you come to a crossroad like that, in this game, the drug game, there's it's a lose-lose situation so if you if you know that before you make that decision you'll you'll be all right but if you make that decision knowing that it's a lose-lose then that's on you you know what i mean but 
it's just a lose-lose situation. No matter what's going on in the world out here, <clears throat> there's always going to be, you've always got a choice to decide which direction you want to take. You know what I mean? Always try to do the right thing. Always try to make the right decision. Don't, don't go down the path we took because it'll ruin your family in the long run. You know what I mean? There's short term gain, but in the long run, it's not worth it. You know what I mean? If you decided to take the other path, you might struggle, but there's always, at least you got an opportunity while you're in that struggle to be still out here with your family and loved ones. You know what I mean? That's, there's always, there's always going to be ups and downs as long as you can just weather the storm. You know what I mean? And as long as you're doing the right thing, everything will work out for you, I feel like. You know, I feel like dudes that get out of prison, you know, before we go, I'm going to ask you one more question and say something. I feel like when we've been in prison and we lost that stuff, man, that, you know, we've been there a long time. Once you get out, right, I feel like, man, we learn to appreciate things more. How much time oh. did you do before you ended up getting out? I done a little over 15 years before I get out. And let me tell you, I appreciate every little thing, every little thing. It, it, it's nothing that I don't appreciate. You know what I mean? And people ask me like, why are you thanking me? Why are you doing this? Or I tell them I love them all the time. You know what I mean? Or just little things that I don't see a lot of people doing. You know what I mean? And I do them. Do them because you appreciate it. Yes, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. And I'll make sure I'll let them know that. Because when I, you know, I mean, when you first get out, you ain't got much. You got to kind of depend on other people, and you know what I mean. And I'll make sure I'll let them know how much I appreciate them. I'm, a, I'm talking down to the, to the smallest detail. I appreciate you doing this for me, driving me here, picking me up. You don't know how much this is helping me. You know what I mean. I, I'll break it down to them, and I'll just straight up with them. Because without that, I wouldn't be where I am today. By the grace of God, we all made it, man. Me, you, Mau Mau, um, just numerous people that got out under the stack nine. Reggie, um, I did Reggie's case. Reggie got out. Reggie had 39 years for bank robbery. It's just, it's a blessing for us to be out, man, and we do appreciate our freedom. One last question before we go, Dalyon. From all the things that you've been through, you know, the times where you might have thought, damn, man, or the things that you've seen, do you think prison... And the violence and the things that you've seen affected you mentally and emotionally? Did it mess you up a little bit? No, I just it made me appreciate life more, and it and it and it and it it, it opened my eyes up to how how uh, heartless some people can be. You know what I mean? It just it just it really made me appreciate life more. It didn't really affect me mentally because I'm I'm still the same person I was when I went in. I didn't really change much. I just appreciate life more. You know what I mean? I, I appreciate what I've been given, what God has given me. You know what I mean? And at first, I just didn't appreciate it. When you go into a place like that and you see people around you that just don't care and you know they're out there and you thought you was a, one of the few, but there's a bunch of them out there. You know what I mean? Because when I was out there selling drugs, I thought I thought it was normal. Because I'd always been around people who sold drugs. I thought, and then when I realized the hell, very few people are actually getting into trouble. We're the minority. When you, you know what I mean? When you start getting in trouble, we're really the minority. I mean, you got people getting speeding tickets, but ain't nobody out there really packing pistols and selling drugs. And, you know what I mean? I mean, there's a lot of people in jail for it, but overall, it's not that many. No doubt. Listen, man. Hey, hey, one more thing, Chad. I want to I wanna tell you how much I appreciate you for what you did too, bro. Without you and what you're standing for and, and what, what God has laid on your heart, man, it's beyond words, man. And uh, I want to let everybody out there know that uh, I'm, I'm really thankful for you, bro. And you keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you having given me the opportunity to help you. And you know what? It always feels good when you get people out of jail that deserve it. And I can say on this show, bro, 100%, 
You worked hard in prison. You educated yourself. You worked. You kept your nose clean. You stayed out of trouble. You deserve to get out of prison. And there's so many guys just like you that are not getting that opportunity in the 11th Circuit, in the 3rd Circuit, because of the laws. That You know, this is going to the Supreme Court, and hopefully those guys will start getting out of prison. But I definitely yeah. appreciate you, man. Yeah, and it kind of sucks when I can get out in one part of, of uh, an area, and this guy in that part of the area with the same charges can't get out, and he's doing the right thing. He's doing everything he can to get out and can't get out. It's, it's sad. It's sad. There's plenty of people in there, man, people like Ian Owens. They deserve to get out more than I deserve to get out. And, you know, some of these guys are in Florida and Georgia. They can't get out because the court said, oh, that law don't apply down here and, you know, in Pennsylvania. But hopefully, you know, this will get resolved in the Third Circuit. I think John uh, in the Supreme Court, my the guy that represented me, former federal judge John Gleason that prosecuted yeah. John Gotti, he's uh, I think he's going to do some Supreme Court stuff. And hopefully they get the win, man, and other, you know, brothers and sisters get the opportunity that we got. Bro. Man, I hope, I hope they do win. I hope they do win. Man, I'll, I'll be praying for it, bro. Listen, man, I'm going to close the show, man. I appreciate you, man. Glad to see you're doing good. Glad to see you living your life, man. Take care of them brand babies, man. Live your best life. I'm going to tell people, man, hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button. Share this video because someone needs to hear it, man. I definitely do. With All right, peace, bro. All right, Big with love. respect, we're out.